Father in heaven, we want to see you in all of your greatness. We want to see your son in all of his um, kingliness. We want to see your grace as the supreme power that it is over our lives. Would you please take our minds and lift them up? Lord, I thank you that we can sing um, words that come from scripture that help us to set our minds on the things above where Christ is. And we pray that now you would just advance our worship even further as we have our Bibles open, that we might see you, that you might be the focal point, that you might be the big deal and not us. Lord, that's what we need is more of you, less of ourselves. You must increase and we must decrease. And may we see the power of your grace at work in our lives. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We haven't been here for a while, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to catch you back up a little bit to speed here on it, and Lord willing, we'll even finish it today. What do you think about that? I hope you didn't make lunch plans until 1. Just a reminder, Paul by the time he writes this, has been on three missionary journeys. He's at the end of his third missionary journey, and he's been doing this for about 10 years of his life. And he preached this gospel without shame everywhere he went in the Roman Empire. He said, basically, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That salvation by the power of grace then ushers in a brand new life lived for Jesus Christ. A a transformation comes. Conformity to Jesus Christ comes. A life of obedience comes all by grace's unrivaled power. And there was one class or one kind of person who took particular offense at that gospel of God's grace. Who? It was the religious man who trusted in his own abilities. It's the religious man who believed that all he needed to be accepted by God was the power of a good set of rules, a good set of laws. He is the self-confident, law-loving religious man. To him, law's power is impressive because law punches every sin squarely in the nose with a thou shalt not every single time from his perspective. To the self-confident man, that feels effective against sin. When that self-confident, law-loving, religious person hears Paul's gospel even today, that that gospel by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, um, it isn't Christ that's the sticking point. And it wasn't and it isn't faith that's the sticking point. It was grace. Grace is the sticking point. The self-confident, law-loving, religious man was skeptical of grace, critical of grace, Because grace in the gospel does not allow the self-confident man to present good works to God that come from his powerful set of laws. You see, the self-confident, law-loving, religious man is fine with believing as long as he can also present some works from his law. And the self-confident, law-loving, religious man, he's fine with Jesus as long as he can also what? present some good works along that come from his powerful set of laws. But grace is the problem. Grace is the problem. Because grace denies the self-confident, law-loving, religious man what he wants and clings to most, which is his own abilities and his own set of laws. And Paul had to fight against the slanderings from that kind of man against grace everywhere he went across the Roman Empire. And Romans 6 has one great theme. 
grace. Grace as a power that reigns supremely to save sinners and then to sanctify the believer. But Romans 6 is divided into two sections, and they are the gospel's defense of grace against two slanderous charges that were most prevalent. The charges against grace, they come from that self-confident, law-loving religious man. The first defense of grace by the gospel is in the first 14 verses of chapter 6. According to the self-confident, law-loving religious man, since grace is not interested at all in good works that you can do, since grace is not interested at all in the suppression of your sins with law first, therefore grace will leave you unchanged before sin. In fact, grace will even be permissive in regards to your sin. That's that man's thinking and slanderous charge. And the emphasis in the charge against grace in verses 1 and 2 is on continuing in sin, verse 1, still living in it, verse 2. If we say that guy lives in the gym, what do we mean? We don't mean that he's there once in a while, but it's his life. That's the emphasis in chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, is the charge is grace will do nothing to bring any change in the believer's life in regards to sin. And so gospel defense, number one, in the first 14 verses, you can see it up there on the screen, grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. A fundamental radical change in relationship to sin has been achieved for the believer in Jesus Christ by the power of grace. Paul spends 14 verses on this, developing it. Sin is still sin. But the believer is a new person in the presence of those same old sins. The second defense of grace by the gospel is in verses 15 to 23 in this chapter. And the emphasis in this section is on fighting against sin here and sin there. Verse 15, what shall we say? Because we are not under law. Uh, I'm sorry, what shall we? Let me start over again. My tongue is ahead of my brain. And it's really bad, isn't it? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under a law, but under grace? May it never be. The emphasis here is on fighting against sin here or sin there, where in the first part it was about continually living in sin. And the gospel's defense of grace in this section shows that grace as a power is the only power against sin for the believer. Law as a power is worthless against sin, anywhere, everywhere, all the time. In fact, if you are still under sin as a, or under law as a power, you are still a slave of sin. But if you are under grace as a power, you are no longer a slave to sin, and you have the only power against sin that God has designed. Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, believer, because you are not under law, but you are under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Of course not. And that brings us to the second defense of grace by the gospel. Grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. And this is where we have been. So why don't we review the first six and then we'll pick up the remaining ones. Therefore, if this is the case, that grace is not rivaled by law as a power in the fight against sin, well then, grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer. Number one, contrasts and clarifies the only two slave categories possible. Verse 16, you are either a slave of sin or you are a slave of obedience to God. Secondly, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer creates thankfulness to God for my new slavery, verse 17. But thanks be to God. Listen, the self-confident, law-loving, religious man does not have God as his focal point in thankfulness because his eyes are on himself and his law. Thirdly, Grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer delivered me over to a teaching pattern with heart-generated obedience, verse 17. That language there, um, that form of teaching to which you were committed, that's, that's like slave language. That's the handing over, an authoritative, dominating handing over of yourself to the teaching that you were 
given over to. It's a way of saying that the teaching of the Word of God is your master, and you have heart-generated obedience under it now. Fourthly, grace's unrivaled power against sin and the believer abruptly displaced my old slavery with my new slavery. Verse 17, though you were slaves of sin, boom, you became obedient from the heart. Verse 18, having been freed from sin, boom, you became slaves of righteousness. There's no transitional period. You are not a a caterpillar transitioning into a butterfly. You are not a tadpole slowly transitioning into a frog where you kind of look like a tadpole and you kind of look like a frog at the same time sometimes. That is not the language of what grace does. It is an abrupt displacement. It is an abrupt salvation event, conversion. One slavery to uh, to the new. Fifthly, grace's unrivaled power against sin and the believer speaks clearly to me to make my new slavery understandable. Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, Paul says. I have human fleshly weakness that just makes this an uphill climb for me to get. And Paul's trying to put the grace cookies on the bottom shelf for us. Sixthly, grace's unrivaled power against sin and the believer commands me, full stop, commands me. Verse 19, there's a command. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness. All this talk about not wanting to be under the power of the law does not mean you will be without commands. Grace commands. You have no fear in hearing this language from Romans 6 about you don't want to be under the power of law because under the power of grace, you will be commanded, but from a whole new principle. It commands me to arrive at sanctification or holiness of life as surely as I used to arrive at lawlessness. Now let's start with new ones this morning in verse 20. Number seven, grace's unrivaled power against sin and the believer, number seven, reminds me that righteousness used to have no dominion over me. This is terrifying. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. This is an explanation that's going on here. It starts with the word for. There's been quite an extensive ongoing contrast since verse 16 between these two slaveries. you either a slave of sin or a slave of obedience to God, verse 16. In verse 17, you're either a slave of sin or you're a slave that has been handed over to the teaching of the word of God. In verse 18, you're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. And at that point in the contrast, Paul Uh, takes righteousness and it gets personified like it has dominion as a Lord. It has power as a master to rule. It has an authority over a slave who is the believer. And in verse 19, your members are slaves to impurity or they are slaves to righteousness. And now in verse 20, Paul wants to explain and expand on that personification of righteousness as a slave master. The main idea in verse 20 is in the middle, you were free. Paul means there was a freedom that you once had. And you say, well, wait a minute, how? When? What about all the emphasis on, you know, that you were either a slave in one category or you were a slave in the other? If we go from slavery to slavery uh, abruptly in salvation, where is this free category that Paul now says was there? You experienced that freedom when? When you were slaves to sin. Okay, now that's even more confusing. So you're saying I was free when I was a slave? And Paul says yes with the worst kind of freedom you'll ever know. Here's the point. Paul is still saying the exact same thing that he has been in this entire section. If you are a slave to sin, when you are a slave to sin, then you are free from the other possible master who is righteousness. When you are a slave to sin, if you are a slave to sin, You can't also at the same time be under the dominion, under the governance, under the jurisdiction of, under the lordship of, within the boundaries of the other master. When you are a slave of sin, you are not a slave of righteousness. And if you are not a slave of righteousness, then you are free in regard to righteousness. That puts a twist on the whole idea of free in this whole slave contrast. Paul reminds the believer under the reign of the power of grace 
that he used to not be under the reign of righteousness. He didn't used to be within the governing reach and the dominion of righteousness. He wasn't within the boundaries of where righteousness reigned because he was a slave to sin. And by this, Paul does not mean that unbelievers do not, are not held accountable um, to the standard of righteousness. What he's saying is that the unbeliever just lies outside the reach of the reign of righteousness, the governance of righteousness. And we need to think bigger thoughts about why unbelievers don't do righteous things. And this is helpful for us. If I think of righteousness as little itemized righteousnesses, you know, like a righteous thought here and a righteous word to speak there and a righteous attitude over there and a righteous deed done over here and a righteous desire over here formed in my heart. And if I think the believer then stands before those little itemized righteousnesses and has the choice to pick them up or not and express them, but just chooses not to because, well, you know, he's a sinner. He's not interested in them. That's true, but that's not what Romans 6 is saying here. Something bigger is being said here than that. Paul has personified righteousness as a master, as a ruler, with dominion everywhere it rules. Righteousness has a reach. It has a realm over which it rules. And where then do you find righteous practices taking place in this world? True righteous practices. Well, over there, where righteousness is reigning as a master, that's where you're going to find righteous thinking going on, righteous words being spoken, righteous attitudes picked up, and righteous deeds and desires taking place. But what if you're not under that reign of, or reach of righteousness over there? Well, then, you're not a slave under it over there. You are free from that influence and that will of righteousness. And where righteousness expresses itself, you're not there. Turn back to Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And just as they, the human race, did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, what did God do? God gave them over decisively, completely, without a doubt. He gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper. What's the first description? Being filled with what? All unrighteousness. There is the one. How did you not end up in the reign of righteousness, God, in his wrath, handed us all over outside of it to the place where we are given over to a depraved mind and we are now filled with all unrighteousness. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. It's written, there is none righteous over there. Not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All of them have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There's that solidarity we had with Adam. We are cemented together in unrighteousness. Each one of us filled with all unrighteousness. And that's called being free in regard to righteousness. Chapter 6, verse 21. It is true that as an unbeliever, you don't want to have anything to do with righteous thinking, righteous words spoken, righteous attitudes picked up, righteous deeds performed, righteous desires formed within. It's true, you want uh, to have nothing to do with any of that. The, the question is why? Why don't you? It is because you are not over there under the reign of where righteousness exerts its righteous will in its subjects. That's why you don't. You lie outside of its borders. You are free from its righteous border and reign. Righteousness doesn't have anything to do with you, and that's why you don't want anything to do with righteousness. Righteousness. 
That's why you can't do what is righteous in thought, word, attitude, deed, and desire. Because you are a slave of sin. And herein lies the flow of the gospel in Romans. You are filled with all unrighteousness and you are in solidarity with everybody else in that unrighteousness. All of us have turned aside. Together we have all become useless before God. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's righteousness is being revealed to that slab of unrighteous humanity. And it's revealed every time somebody believes. It's revealed from faith to faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. And that is how you are going to get out of that unrighteous slab that you're embedded in. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you believe Jesus Christ, that he suffered the wrath of God on the cross in your place, you are forgiven. Through that faith in Jesus Christ, even though you have only ever been unrighteous in that slab of humanity, God declares over you his very own status of righteousness. He takes you and he positions you under his righteous standard and his status, even though you never earned it, even though you never deserved it. And now from that new status, you also find yourself being owned by righteousness. It's your master now. You are now within its borders. And so righteous thinking is possible. Righteous words are available to you. Righteous attitudes and deeds and desires can be picked up by you. It wasn't merely that you had no regard for righteousness as a sinner. But God put you in a new category. So not only are you now righteous with God's very status of righteousness that you could never have earned, you now also are righteous in your practice when, verse 19 of chapter 6, you present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in holiness. But when you were slaves of sin, you were, you were free in regard to that reign of practical righteousness. When you were a slave of sin, righteousness did not reign over you. It had no dominion over you. It had no influence over you. It had no regard for you. And that explains why you were unrighteous in your thoughts, in your words, in your attitudes, in your deeds, and in your desires. That's why you were filled with all unrighteousness, because God gave you over to a depraved mind someplace else away from righteousness. It wasn't merely that you had no regard for righteousness as a sinner, but righteousness at that time had no regard for you either. It did not exercise its righteous rule over you in your thinking, in your words, and so forth, because you were a slave of sin. And why is the gospel making this point in Romans 6? Why? Again, the power of law is not what you want to turn to in your fight against sin here or there in your life. You never left the slave of sin category by using law as a power. And you didn't put yourself within the boundaries, within the jurisdiction of righteousness through law as a power. All law does in its power is intensify your sin into transgression. Romans chapter 5 verse 20. Law came in. So that, it would tr so that the transgression would increase. Law as a power never produces righteousness. Law as a power never increases righteousness. And if law as a power can't bring about a change in your slave identity, all the more reason why you should never turn to it as a power to fight against any of your sin. Anytime. Grace as a power being under grace as a power is God's means for you to fight against your sin. And Paul is trying to present grace to us in such a category far above any other power, especially the power of law, such that you would have full confidence in the grace of God in your life as you live a life for Jesus Christ. Now, if, if you're an unbeliever, <clears throat> 
you might think you're free. You know, free to live how you want to live. Free to choose whatever you want to choose. You're free to think what you want to think, say what you want to say, do what you want to do. You're free to desire all that you desire. That is a mythical freedom, according to Romans 6. But there is a real freedom you experience if you are an unbeliever, and it is this grim freedom that you are free in regard to righteousness. Meaning, all that God says is right in thought, word, attitude, uh, deed, and desire, it has no regard for you. You are completely incapable of doing what is right, and the only difference between you in that condition and the believer in Jesus Christ is grace. The power of the reign of grace. The difference between the unbeliever and the believer is not that the believer has been more effective with a set of laws than you have been yet. Number eight, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the life of the believer exposes the fruitless life and fatal end of my old slavery to sin secured for me. Verse 21, grace exposes the fruitless life and fatal end of my old slavery to sin secured for me. If you, as a slave of sin, were once beyond the reach of the rule and the reign of righteousness, what benefit, what fruit could possibly come forth from your life from God's perspective? Verse 21, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? The answer is so obvious, Paul doesn't even have to answer it directly. No benefit at all. To be a slave of sin from God's measurement and from God's assessment, that's to live a fruitless life. The word benefit in the New American Standard is the word fruit. It's just there was not a particle of fruit anywhere in your slavery to sin. You were free with the grimmest freedom without Christ, which means that you were also fruitless from God's perspective in that freedom. But that's not all. Look at verse 21. At the end of a life of fruitlessness, what comes for the outcome of those things is death. Outcome just means the end. The end of that life of slavery is death for the slave of sin. Now, death here means much more than physical dying. Romans 5 and 6 has been thinking about death way beyond the physical category. But it is spiritual death. It is a death that is actually in contrast with the eternal life that's mentioned in the next two verses. What is coming for the slave of sin is a spiritual death, and that spiritual death means it will be an irreversible death, an an unchangeable condition of deadness to God that will be the outcome, a deadness to God that will never be, have an opportunity to change again like you have the opportunity to have it change now. It is a spiritually, eternally unchangeable deadness to God that merits forever God's unending wrath in judgment. So in this physical life right now, the slave of sin lives beyond the reach and the rule of righteousness, and in that wretched freedom, the slave of sin has no fruit to bear for God. And then the end of that life is terrifying. Grace exposes the fruitless life and the fatal end that my old slavery to sin secured for me. Now, why is the gospel making this defense of grace? Because some are tempted by the supposed power of law. Some are impressed with law as a power to fight against sin here and there. So the gospel exposes for us just how fruitless life was and how fatal our end would have been spiritually for us apart from God's grace. In fact, many of us as former slaves of sin, we thought that all we needed to do was pick up law as a power and try to rectify for ourselves our fruitlessness before God. 
Or we thought that all we had to do was pick up the power of law and that would keep us from never-ending judgment under God's wrath. The defense of grace is making this point. Law as a power had no fertilizing effect on the toxic soil of your heart such that you would start bearing fruit and you will remain without fruit no matter what law you try to energize yourself with. And law as a power will only secure your spiritual death that is coming. Chapter 5, verse 20 Law came in so that transgression would increase. Verse 21, sin reigned in death. And so if law has a pow- as a power had no effect on your fruitless life as a slave of sin, and if law as a power had no effect on averting your coming spiritual death, then what good will it have as a power against this sin here or that sin there? None. Grace as a power is not rivaled at all by law as a power. Number nine, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer transformed me such that I now am ashamed of my sin. Let's zero in on this amazing statement tucked away in the middle of verse 21. Do you see it there? The things of which you are now ashamed. For the believer in Jesus Christ, something truly life-altering has happened. Something mind-renewing has happened. Now, when you think back on your life as a slave of sin, that, that you once lived beyond the boundaries of righteousness, and that you were therefore full of all unrighteousness, and that you bore no fruit for God. When you think on all of that, when that comes to mind, you're ashamed. You're ashamed of those things. That kind of living is disgraceful to you now. Your ability to think on those things and measure and assess those things, you have a new filter to look at them and assess them. When you were a slave of sin, when you were a a dead tree that bore no fruit for God, you never gave any of that a second thought. You gloried in your sin. But what happened? Here's the story of Romans. By the power of grace, everything changed, believer. You were somehow united with Christ crucified. You were united with Christ buried. And that old sin-enslaved, fruitless life, that old self that was in solidarity with everybody else in unrighteousness, that one was put to death once and for all in your union with Christ crucified and Christ buried. And by the power of grace, you were also uh, united with Christ, raised from the dead. And now that means a new life in union with him has come forth for you. A whole brand new identity exists for you. And in that new man, you can reckon with your mind and take into account with your mind new realities that the gospel has achieved for you by the power of grace. And you think now about your old life and you think about your old slavery very differently now. When God allows memories of unrighteousness and your former slavery to sin to come in, shame rises up in your heart. Disgrace comes to mind when you think of those things. This is one of the greatest evidences of the new birth, of being born again. It's being ashamed of sin, slavery to sin, Being ashamed of unrighteous things, a fruitless life. If your thoughts of your sin or your fruitless living before God does not stir up shame, that may be an indicator that you have not yet been changed by God through union with Christ. Christ. 
believer. Also, here's a way to take a spiritual health measurement even today. When you sin, how do you respond? Lately, have you been responding with defensiveness or indifference? Or is your response to sin that it's disgraceful? Are these things of which you are now ashamed? What if you find yourself instead growing defensive of your sin or even indifferent to your sin? Well, that, believer, that should be a big red alarm warning signal and siren going off. Shame over what you used to be without Christ and the lingering indwelling effects of sin in your life, that Shame over that, that, that's evidence of a new power at work within you, a new principle within you that's pushing you against the grain and the stream of sin. It's the power of grace. Now, let's distinguish between the power of law and the power of grace in this idea of shame. Law as a power, listen carefully, law as a power, when you sin, will indeed bring shame upon you. It will. But law as a power will use shame to push you into a deeper internal drive to try harder with the law. It'll push you towards penance. You have something to prove now. And those under law as a power perhaps are indeed ashamed of their sin, but they are not turned away from themselves with that shame to look for help. Instead, they're just shamed by the power of law into greater self-efforts with the law. You see, your shame will turn you more fervently to the law. How is the power of grace different when you fall and fail to trust grace's power in the face of sin? You will be ashamed of your sin. But the shame that you feel will empty you of you. It will empty you of self-confidence. Grace as a power will use shame to help humble you. Shame under, the, under grace as a power will not lead you to self-righteous attempts of penance, but instead will lead you to genuine repentance. Shame under the power of grace will lead you to faith, not law, to trust the Lord, to trust in his grace more and better next time temptation comes knocking. Number 10, grace's power against sin in the believer promises fruitful holiness and eternal life in my new slavery to God, verse 22. Look at verse 22, but now. That indicates the contrast to being a slave to sin has arrived. And the big idea in verse 22 is, uh, or in verses uh, 20 to 22 here, is in slavery to sin, there's no fruit and only a fatal end. Now, having been freed from that sin, there's fruit unto holiness or sanctification, and the end is eternal life. And the promise made here by grace to the believer, it couldn't be more the opposite than what slavery to sin brings about. So let's work through the details in verse 22. Here's the main statement in verse 22. But now, dot, 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 you derive your benefit. You have your fruit. But now, in contrast to before, but now you have your fruit. So what had to happen that you, believer, could now be fruitful in your daily living for God? Well, you had to, verse 22, be freed from sin, and you had to be enslaved to God. From one slavery right into the next, with no space or time between them, no transitional period, just an abrupt displacement of slaveries. Having been freed from sin, in verse 22, means that it was done to you, it was done for you, you received this liberation, you did not set yourself free. And remember, contextually, what does it mean to be freed from sin? 
It does not mean that sin has been finally and completely removed from your life such that you no longer sin. That's called heaven. What it means is that you are no longer under the dominion of sin. You are no longer its helpless subject. You can now do something more than just helplessly obey sin. You can resist sin. You must resist sin. And enslaved to God, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, that also means it was done to you. And from what I can tell in this passage, this is now the fourth description of the new slavery achieved by the grace and the the power of grace. The first one was you are a slave of obedience in verse 16. The second one is the language of that form of teaching to which you were committed as slave language. It means you were handed over and delivered over into the possession of the teaching of Scripture such that it is now your master. The Word of God, you are a slave to its teaching now by the power of grace. The third description is you are a slave of righteousness, verse 18. And now, verse 22, you are a slave of God. One slavery presupposes the other. Which makes it clear then as to how and why you are fruitful in your living as a believer. You, you're a slave of obedience now. Um, the teaching that you were delivered over to, it rules over you. Uh, righteousness, you are under its boundaries now. And God is your master. How could you not be fruitful for him? This perfectly aligns with everything Jesus ever said about needing to bear fruit for him and only being able to bear fruit in him. And notice the believer's fruitfulness is expanded on in verse 22. What is the fruit? It is resulting in sanctification or it is unto holiness. Fruitfulness is defined by holiness. Fruitfulness falls into the category of holiness. Holy thoughts, holy words spoken, holy attitudes and deeds and desires, that's fruitful living. Holy fruit, fruitful holiness. But that is not all that is promised us. Notice the outcome. And the outcome is what? Eternal life. That's God's very life. As the eternal God, he is indestructible in his life. He is unfading in life, unwavering, powerful, and pure in the life that he has, that he gives us. It's deposited in the believer at the new birth, at faith, but not yet fully experienced in its entirety until when? Until Jesus gets all of the glory that is due his name, which means when he finally and forever puts away even death itself into the lake of fire. That day, that then will be the greatest and final, fullest expression of eternal life that any believer will ever know. Enjoyed now, anticipated then. That is the believer's ultimate end and outcome. And it is the eternal opposite of the outcome of the unbeliever. What a difference grace makes. There is a freedom in verse 20 that ultimately ends in the most tragic eternal death in verse 21. And there is a slavery that results in the most eternally treasurable life with Jesus. (laughs) A freedom unto death, a slavery unto eternal life, a tragic and devastating freedom. Is that what you know? If so, today you must come to Jesus Christ. He invites people just like you. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Maybe you feel weary and burdened under your unrighteousness. Maybe you feel weary and heavy laden because you've taken up law and you've tried. You've tried and you're just not there. You never will be. And he bids you to throw it to the ground and to come to him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, he says, and I will give you 
rest. Rest for your soul. He gives you peace with him. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He has every intention to rule you. And it is so good. It is a great peacefulness. It is a great rest for your soul to be under his yoke. You must come today. Become fruitful. Become holy in your practice because of his saving work. Begin the enjoyment of eternal life even now, which you ultimately will enjoy in its fullest expression one day with him. And again, what is the point being made regarding law as a power? What's the point? Law as a power could never deliver such a promise like grace makes here. Law as a power will never get you to fruitfulness. It'll never get you to holiness, but it will only get you to greater transgressions. Neither will it ever get you to eternal life. So why try to live under its power now in your own abilities to fight against sin here or there? And lastly, number 11. Grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer climaxes the staggering contrast between sin and God and the outcomes of their slaveries. We reach the climax, verse 23. It's time to bring this contrast between the slavery of sin and slavery to God to an end, and it's contrast with diametrically opposed outcomes as well. Each master has an outcome, and each master gets its outcome. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sin is the first master, and we know its outcome is death, right? Verse 21 said such, but also so did Romans 5.21. Just look at this. Romans 5.21, sin reigned in death. Chapter 6, verse 16 Um, You're one of these two slaves. You're either a sin resulting in death, a slave of sin resulting in death. Verse 21, the outcome of those things is death. Verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Where sin reigns, this spiritual death is everywhere. But notice how chapter 6, verse 23 says it. It says, the wages of sin of sin is death. Now, now wages, usually, usually the receiving of wages is a good thing, right? How do you feel on payday? How do you feel three days before payday? That's kind of telling, isn't it, sometimes? You worked hard for your wages. Your paycheck is welcomed by you. You earned it. You deserve it. But what a twisted payday sin has for you. Spiritual death, that everlasting deadness to God in eternal wrath from God, an irreversible condition of deadness toward him in wrath. That is a payday unlike anything you'll ever know or have known. At the end of your career of slaving under sin, slaving for sin, your wages will be paid out. You will get what you've earned. It's death. You will get exactly what is coming to you. Your wages are deserved. Death is the just and rightful and fully merited payday for the one whose life is dominated by sin. What a staggering slavery sin has for you. Consider the other slavery under God. But the free gift of God is eternal life. And do you see how the contrast is even amplified? Sin has wages. God does not. God does not pay wages to anyone. By the way, you don't want God to give you what you've earned. Instead, God has a gift that is marked by wages. 
the freeness in which he gives it. He's free to give this gift, which means that he's not bound to give it to you. He just gives it freely. And at the end of a life of service of slavery to God, a free gift is placed in your hands in all of its fullness. It's already given in one sense, but the fullest outcome of it is coming. And that life with God is not earned. It is not merited. It's not deserved by you or me. But God's gift is given freely. And this eternal life in verse 23, look down there with me, is inseparable from our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you get Jesus, you get this eternal life. If you get this eternal life, you get it in connection with him. So one slavery pays you what you deserve. And the other slavery gives you what you could never earn or what you deserve. One slavery pays you death and judgment and hell forever. And the other freely gives you eternal life in connection with a person, Jesus. One master is sin and the other master is God. The question for you is which slave are you? Are you a slave of sin or are you a slave of God? There could not be more at stake for you in getting to the bottom of that question. And verse 23 provides a way for you to measure where you are spiritually. Unbelievers usually get this completely upside down and backward. They get what they deserve and do not deserve completely backwards. An unbeliever most of the time says, oh, I deserve acceptance from God and, and I do not deserve hell. I'm not as bad as most and I've done some good things. Listen, that kind of thinking is, is wicked and it needs to be repented of. It's godless thinking. Do you think you deserve eternal life? Do you think you don't deserve hell and judgment? If you answer those with a yes, you need to repent and come to Jesus Christ today. The true believer is exactly the opposite. Here's what a true believer says and knows. I do not deserve eternal life with Christ. And I do deserve hell. I am worse than you will ever know. And God's grace is greater than we all will ever know. That is the evidence of grace's transforming powerful work within. That's evidence of slavery to God. Whose slave are you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we marvel that you save sinners. And what vivid, amazing, staggering, stunning, breathtaking details there are in this salvation that you have provided for us. Thank you for being a God with a free gift and not a God with wages to give. Thank you for sharing the very life that you have and are with us, giving it to us freely. Lord, I thank you that you, you don't give it to us separate from Jesus. But this life is in connection with him. Lord, forever you continue to just point us to your son. You never let us think about eternal life without him, apart from him, as if somehow we get a life and, 
with you or for us and we're not really sure where he is. No, we only can think of this life in connection with him. Your son is everything to us because your life is bound up in him and that is the life you have for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the life, the eternal life you give that you've deposited even now, that you've inaugurated even now in our lives, but that, oh, one day there will be a fullness to it that comes that not even our beloved ones in heaven have tasted yet fully because death has not been yet put away everywhere. Oh, Lord, we want to see Jesus be glorified and get his due in every possible way. In the meantime, while we live yet another day in this body. Lord, I pray that you would make it clearer to some here, whoever here needs to repent and come to Christ. Lord, draw them even now. Save them. And for those of us whom you have already saved, Lord, may we be absolutely impressed with your grace and its power. May we live for you more faithfully because of its power in our lives, even today. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen.